basically uh, going up, which is in a week. So we'll be concentrating more on um, that verse. Uh, the whole of this chapter, chapter 17, is a prayer, the longest prayer that Jesus ever offered, and it was recorded for us to read. And this prayer, it's systematic. You realize that from verse 1 to 5, Jesus prays for himself. From verse 6 to verse 19, he prays for his disciples. And from verse 20 to verse 26, he prays for all believers, you and me. So the book of John, there is a lot of, you know, contention as to who the author is because the book does not bear the name of the author in it. But majority of the scholars say that the author of this book is John, the disciple of Jesus Christ, and also same John who wrote the book of Revelation. The book of John is different in its style because it's not in the category of the Gospels known as Synoptic. The first three Gospel books are known as Synoptic, meaning that they view things through the same lens. They, have, they are focusing more on the humanity, but the book of John focuses more on the divine side of Jesus Christ. The Synoptic Gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke focuses more on the physical things. The book of John focuses more on the spiritual matters. It's a book of belief. They believed, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's an interesting study. And so in chapter 17, Jesus Christ is approaching the cross. And at this time, we see him making this long and beautiful systematic prayer on his behalf, on behalf of his 11 disciples, because you realize at this point that Judas is not among the number. And he prays also on behalf of you and me, the saints of this present age. And so in this prayer, in the first part we see Jesus Christ making requests on his own behalf, that is from verse 1 to verse 5. Let's see. This was Jesus spake and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. One interesting thing that you observe as you read through chapter 17 is that all the prayer that God made, that Christ made, either for his own behalf, on behalf of his disciples and all the saints that will come, is that everything was for the glory of his Father. Even when he's praying for himself, Father, the hour is come. In other chapters, when Christ is praying, he's saying that my hour is not yet here, it's not yet come. But during this time, Jesus agrees that the time has come for me to face the cross. The time has come for me to be glorified. The time has come for my Father to be glorified. And how shall my Father be glorified? Is through me partaking this cup of the cross that has been set or prepared ahead of me. So the Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So there are a lot of doctrines that you can derive from this chapter again. He's speaking on behalf of every believer of all ages, because he acknowledges that all power has given to him over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. 
So there are people whom the Father has delivered to the hands of Christ Jesus for him to save them. And so he's praying on their behalf again that the power has given on Christ Jesus and is for eternal life to them that the Father has given to him. In verse 3 it says that, and this is eternal, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So this is eternal life, that they might know you, God the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So Jesus Christ acknowledges that there is eternal life, he acknowledges that there is only one true God, and this true God is the one who has commissioned him to do his will. At this point, he would have wished for his own will to be fulfilled, but he acknowledges that God, he has decreed God in his own plan, he had an agenda. And in his agenda, it was his will, it was in his plan that Jesus Christ might save his children from their sin. That this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, through the way of God the Father glorifying his Son by him going through the baptism of the death of the cross. I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So Christ Jesus at this time acknowledges that he has been faithful in every matter that was, you know, tasked under him, and that all his life he has been faithful to do everything which God the Father commanded him to do. And he says that, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was, that they might know that I am the very God, same essence, same nature, same attributes, same equal in power and is not lesser than God the Father, only different in the task that they execute. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me. He acknowledges that the time is now come for me to be glorified, for me now to go through the baptism of the death and death of the cross. Other times, he used to say that my hour is not yet here. My time is not come. And the Jewish leadership, the religious leaders, used, you know, to devise ways on how they can arrest him and put him, you know, under death. But Jesus somehow used to maneuver and they could not, you know, arrest him, neither put him, you know, to death. Why? Because it was not time for him to die. Everything God's will and God's timing work hand in hand. You cannot separate God's will and God's timing. It is God's will for Christ Jesus to die for our sins, but we understand it is again God in God's time for him to die. And so at this juncture, it was within his timing that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ should be glorified. And in that same you know, glorification, God the Father again will be glorified. The prayer that he makes Again, this is a request that he makes, you know, for himself when he is praying for himself. That Father might glorify him, that he might glorify him again. From verse 6 all the way to verse 19, Jesus prays for his disciples, for his 11 disciples. And in his prayer, he says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come out of thee, I come out from thee, and they have believed that thou didn't send me. From verse 6 all the way to verse 8, no request Christ is making on behalf of his 11 disciples. He is talking, he is communing with his Father. And sometimes when we go before God, it's not all about making requests to him. 
Sometimes we must realize that it is an avenue for us to commune with our God in as much as, yes, it is good for us to make requests, it is good to go before Him with some, you know, needs and present these needs before Him. We must understand that not all time you need to go before Him with, you know, requests, but also understand it's an opportunity for you to communicate, to talk with your God. And so from verse 6 to verse 8, is not making any request on behalf of his, you know, 11 disciples. And from verse 9, he makes, um, he says, I pray for them, I request again. And what is, what is it that he's praying on behalf of his disciples? I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou gavest me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in thee. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. So it's praying. And in verse 12 it says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have any joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray, not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. So first request that is making on behalf of his eleven disciples, we see it in verse 15. That you should keep them. Christ's request concerning his eleven disciples that fathers should keep them, verse 15, keep them from what? Keep them from evil, keep them from error, keep them from sin, keep them from hypocrisy, keep them from division. As we were reading the book of Ephesians, Apostle Paul is addressing the issue of division within, you know, the church of Christ. And so here Christ prays to the Father that he might keep his disciples. At this time, Jesus realized that in days, in few days to come, he will not be with them physically here on earth. And so they will go through difficult times. They will go through persecution. And so he prays on their behalf that God please keep them in this world. Don't remove them. Don't take them out of the world, but keep them from evil. And so disciples needed to be kept because they were to undergo through the most intense crisis of their lives. When you read the book of Acts, you see, and all through all the missiles, you see, the tough times the 11 disciples of Jesus Christ you know, went through. And this is the reason as to why Christ Jesus made this prayer on their behalf. And as you go through chapter 17, there is another thing that you realize is that Christ Jesus is not just making requests to God, but he's making requests and then giving reason why he is making this, this request to God the Father. And so he's requesting that God the Father keeps them. Why? Verse 15, I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil. Why? They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So he's praying to the Father that he keep them. Another request that he makes on behalf of his disciples is that God might sanctify them. Prayer that he makes on behalf of his 11 disciples that God the Father might keep them. Another thing is that he might sanctify them. Verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word sanctify here means to set apart, to consecrate. 
He is praying to God the Father that He might keep them. And keeping them is not just enough, but that He might set them apart for His own use. Tough times are coming ahead of them. And therefore He prays that God the Father might sanctify them through the truth and His word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Keep them apart from the world. There are dangers that the world may try to influence them, but he is praying on behalf of the eleven especially, because Christ was about to use them in a very special way, because they were to do the work of laying the foundation of the church, and the work of laying the foundation of the church is not a simple task, and this we see the apostles, you know, the prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, doing the work of laying the foundation of the church. And therefore he prays for them that God might sanctify them, that he might consecrate them, that he might use them for his own glory. And this was not, you know, an easy thing. They needed to soak themselves into God's will. They needed, you know, to immerse themselves into understanding God's mind. They needed to know what God's you know, agenda is concerning you know, the universe. And therefore, he makes this prayer on their behalf that God the Father might sanctify them through his truth. Sometimes we consecrate ourselves for other things, but Jesus' request on behalf of his disciples to God the Father was that he might sanctify them through his word, through his truth, and this truth is God's word, the Bible that we are holding this day. And therefore, it's good for us to understand that we, as God's children, we have been consecrated, we have been set apart, and God is sanctifying us through his truth, and this truth is his word. His word does not lie. His word communicates God's mind to us. His mind communicates, you know, God's plan and agenda concerning the universe to all of us. For us to know God's will, we must study God's word. For us to be thoroughly sanctified, we must study God's word and search God in the scriptures. For us to know him, we cannot know him, you know, by the way of just living outside the scriptures. By, by, but by us interacting with his word, we can know his plan and his will concerning us and the universe. So it makes the third request on behalf of his 11 disciples. That request is sent them, verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent, have I also sent them into the world. And from these words, verse 18, is where we get the word mission, missionary. And the word mission comes from Latin word mission, which means to send. And in verse 18 he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent also them into the world. So he's praying for their keeping, he's praying for their sanctification, and he's praying for them to be commissioned, to be sent out to be ambassadors of this good news. And so all of us as God's children, you remember of the great commission that Christ has given us in the book of Matthew chapter 28. And this week we've been going through a series of study, you know, about evangelism and mission. This is a simple yet a noble task that Christ has given to all of us. And here he prays for his 11 disciples, even before they go out officially, to make other people fishers of men. And he prays to God the Father that as you have sent me, because Christ himself is the first person who was sent into the world to bring this good news of salvation. And so as God the Father sent him, 
He also prays on behalf of his 11 disciples that they might be commissioned also to go out and evangelize, to go out and communicate the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, of this love of Jesus, to communicate of his grace, of his mercies to these fallen and lost generation. And so he prays for them that you send them into the world. A world is not, you know, a good place. It's not a favorable place for you to go out and evangelize. It's not, you know, a friendly environment. It's a place where they were to go and meet, you know, um, resistance. But Christ is praying that God the Father might keep them in verse 15. That God the Father might sanctify them through His Word, verse 17, and that He might send them. He understood that it is God who is able to sustain them even in this broken, in this corrupt environment. And he understood that it is through them being sanctified, them being strengthened by the reading of God's word and the Holy Spirit being upon them, they were able to do this great noble task of evangelizing and reaching out to the lost generation. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Why is Christ sanctified himself? Because most of the time we understand when we come across the word sanctification or sanctify is for those who are going through the process of being made clean. But the word sanctification is not necessarily means that does not necessarily communicate to those who are going through the process of being made clean. But he is speaking of him being made, him being set apart and him going again through the baptism of death on the cross. That sanctification set me apart on their behalf. For their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. He has been communicated to them of his death as why he came. He is savior of the world, he is savior of his people from their sinful ways. And how is he going to save them? He threw him undergoing the baptism of death and death of the cross. And so at this time, he is asking that he might be set apart, set aside, that he might go through the baptism of the death and death of the cross, that they also might be strengthened, they might be sanctified through the truth. Fulfillment of the scriptures. Verse 20 to 26, Jesus prays for all believers, for you and for me. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. He understands that as they go out, as Christ, as God keeps them, as he sanctifies them, as he sends them out, there are people who will be won to this saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore he prays that neither pray I for this alone. I'm not just praying for these disciples of mine alone, but for them also we shall believe on, him, on me through their word. So a time will come and they will preach this good news and many people will come to this saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, he's also praying on their behalf that God may keep them, sanctify them, and also send them. Verse 21, that they all may be one. Request that is making on behalf of you and me. That we may be one. Verse 21, why pray for you and for me? That we may be one. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou givest, givest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will 
that they also whom thou givest me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and this have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. It's praying for you and for me that we might be one. The enemy knows the method of divide and rule. He knows how to scatter. He knows how to bring you know, division within the body of Christ. But Christ himself prays that his church might be one, that we might be one strong army, driving our authority from his scriptures and marching onward, fighting our battles manifoldly, knowing the one who has saved us, knowing the one who has commissioned us, and knowing his plan, his mind, and his will concerning this universe. Christ is praying for you and for me that we might be one, that we may understand the teaching of the scriptures, that we may understand the doctrines of the Bible, that we may articulate well, even when we are going out to evangelize, you know, the truth as presented in the scriptures, relying on his wisdom, knowing that the one who has saved us is one, and so we should be one. Knowing that the spirit that made our spirits alive is one, and therefore we should march onward as one. Knowing of the baptism that we went through, the baptism of salvation and the water baptism is one, and therefore moving forward as one army of the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing that we have one master, knowing that we have one Lord and Savior, who is Jesus Christ, and knowing and having a good and clear understanding that the formula of salvation is one by grace through Christ in faith. Understanding, you know, the doctrine and the truth of the Bible. Because we cannot be one if we don't drive, you know, our authority from God's word. Our own ideas, ideologies bring divisions within the body of Christ. But if we are a church that subjects itself into reading the truth of God's word, into understanding God's mind, and, you know, accepting to stay under the authority of the scriptures, then we can move forward as one. Unity cannot come by us, you know, relying on our own understanding, relying on our own ideologies. That is foolishness. But a wise person is one who understands God's mind, understands God's, you know, commission, understands the truth as presented in the scriptures, and makes peace with God's mind. You don't ask questions. You make peace because God is all wise and we are all foolish. We must understand our place and we must understand the place of God. We must understand that we know nothing and He knows everything. We must understand that not unless we understand that, we still have rancors, we still have to fight, we still have division. For us to be united, we must be united by this one truth, by this one doctrine. We must subscribe to the teaching of God's word as a church, as a fellowship, as a person, as an individual. And therefore he prays for you and for me that we might be one. He knew a time will come, people will be full of self, people will be you know, selfish, thinking of themselves, thinking of what I can get from that place, never thinking of the souls, never thinking of the great commission, never thinking of the glory of God, but for their own glory, their stomachs being their own, you know, serving for their own stomachs and not, you know, for the sake of the kingdom of God. He knew that time will come and that time is here with us this day. Where are you? Where am I this day? Are we one? Do we subscribe to this, you know, noble teaching that God has given us this day? Do we cherish this beautiful book? Do we cherish these beautiful writings that God has given us? Because it is God's word alone that can make us wise unto salvation. Our own ideas, our own systems are not to make us wise to salvation. They are foolishness. 
When you feel you are at the epitome of your own idea, think of yourself as a fool. But see God as one who is wise. See God as one who sees, one who knows everything. One in whom we shall stand before and give an account of our own lives. Even as we go out and evangelize, are we evangelizing because we want the world, the universe to be filled with God's glory? Or we want the universe to be filled by I, self, we as AWBC? Do you want Christ to be glorified? Do you want God the Father to be glorified? Or it's all about self, 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 I did this. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and this have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Have you declared of the love of God the Father? We see it through his son Jesus Christ coming here on earth, taking upon himself human flesh, living here on earth under the law of men and in this corrupt environment, dying even the death of the cross, shedding his own precious blood for you and for me, that you may have this moment, that you may have access into the heavenly throne. Do we share of this good news of the love of God? Do we understand that this is the greatest, you know, task that God has given us as believers? We have not been saved to sit down and enjoy and say that we are born again. But do you have that heart for the perishing world? Do you have time to go out and tell your friend, your brother, your sister, your parents, and other people of this love of God. You have tasted of the grace of God. Have you gone out, have you reached out to your brother and sister and extended this same you know, message of the cross to them? Have you ever shared with someone of this you know, great news ever proclaimed in this world? Christ Jesus did not stay silent he preached about himself that he is the way, the truth and life and no one goes to the Father except through him do we point people to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ even amidst you know, difficult economical times when people are at the point of despair are you able to point them to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ or are you just there silent when people you know, are in their disparity are you giving them hope because our hope in this world will not come from the system of the government, will not come you know, from whom we elect, but our hope we must understand that comes from the maker of the heavens and the earth. And the one who takes care of the rabbits, one who takes care of the lilies of the valley, do we understand that he is able to feed us? How much more if he is able to do that to the lilies and to the birds of the field? How much more of you and me? Church, let us wake up from our sleep. Let us search God in the scriptures and let us go out and share the good news of the love of God. Shall we pray? Our God, what in heaven we say thank you because of your word. Thank you because your word is sharper than any two edged sword and it is pure. And it is a shield to them that take refuge in it. Our God, what in heaven we say, thank you because your word is able to make us wise unto salvation. And it gives us wisdom on how to live this part of eternity. May you forgive us for being lazy. May you forgive us for not having time to share good news with the perishing. A good word in heaven is say thank you because of this day and your word that has just come forth to us from you. May it perform that which you purpose for it to do in our lives. May it transform us and not just inform us. A good word in heaven may you give us boldness and power and capacity to say thus say the Lord. 
to say no to all wickedness, to say no to all vices of men and the wicked one. I to stand and to know that you are with us. I to know that you preach that we might be one, even as you are one. God, even as you pray for your disciples, that you keep them, that you sanctify them, and that you send them out. Oh God, we ask that you may keep us as a church, that you might sanctify us by your truth and thy word which is truth, and that you might send us, that we might go out and spread these good tidings of your love. Oh God, what in heaven may you be with us. May you help us that we might be a sound church that cares for the lost, a sound community that goes out, that seeks, even as you came to seek and you, and you found us. May you help us that we may go out and say, Thus says the Lord. May you help us that we may have confidence and boldness to point people to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, because in that there is blessedness. Our God, may you be with us and may you give us peace. May you bless each and every one of us and may you minister to us in a very special way through your word. For Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.